Hello, and welcome to CITR 101.9 FM. You are listening to Democracy Watch. Uh, you be, uh, CITR's uh, news collective, uh, our weekly radio show covering local alternative news stories uh, from Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. My name is Alex DeBoer. And I'm Samuel Jones. It's Thursday, March 7th at 5.02 p.m. We're broadcasting from UBC's Vancouver campus on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Hunkamunum-speaking Musqueam people. Okay. Well, dear listeners, it's that time of the year. Fun Drive. Fun Drive is CITR's annual fundraising campaign, and it begins today. So... You know all this excellent local news we've been bringing you on the radio show. You're listening to now and our municipal politics podcast, Seeking Office. Well, it would be super swell if you could donate and help keep that content going. And the way you can donate is by calling 604-822-8648. Again, that's 604 ubc Unit. If you'd rather donate online, you can go to our website at citr.ca slash donate. That's right. Um, and if you donate, we have some amazing prizes for you. So uh, the show prize for our News Collective's weekly radio show, which you're listening to now, Democracy Watch, uh, and for our podcast seeking office is a one of a kind City Hall horoscope. Ooh. So basically, if you want to figure out which city councillor you are, according to the stars, you can donate just $20 and you'll find out. So this is a pretty cool thing, you know? Uh, it's worth 20 bucks, I think. Um, and in addition to that, the station itself has some rad prizes. Um, we'll just go over them real quick. So if you donate $30 or $5 a month... Uh, I think monthly donations are a great idea myself. Um, You'll get a CITR and Discorder patch. So it's like a really sweet design um, patch that you can uh, apply to your like jean jacket or whatever. Um, And it's uh, got an image of FunDrive. uh, And um, it's just something that is only available during FunDrive. So if you don't get it now, you'll never have it. So, yeah. Um, if you donate $60 at one time or $10 a month, you'll get an exclusive tote, which was designed for Fun Drive for our Ruby Jubilee, which is the theme this year. It's really beautiful. Um, and you'll also get the Fun Drive patch if you donate $101.9 or $15 a month. You get our sweet socks, which are long black socks with a uh, ruby on them. They look really cool. If you are interested in what these prizes look like, you can go to our website at citr.ca slash donate and you can see some photos because I'm probably failing to describe them as well as they could be described. Um, if you donate $175 or $20 a month, you get all the things I just mentioned plus a cassette tape called the fishbowl tape, which has like an array, an array, a list. Uh, it has a long list of really cool local bands um on it and definitely worth uh having once again kind of a limited time thing you're not really gonna have a chance to um get a copy of this cassette any other time if you donate 250 dollars or 25 dollars a month you get a frame cover of discorder magazine um these frame covers come from a art show that was held at the hatch gallery um in the sub here in the nest i guess it's called now So that's pretty sweet. And then um, you can also donate more than that. And we would love that, too. If you donate $1,000 or $50 a month, you get a box set of all the Pop Alliance compilations we've done, which is a compilation CITR does with the local record label Mint Records. And you'll get your name on our donor wall, which means you will be immortalized. Um, So those are the Fun Drive prizes. Um, So... Once again, if you want to donate, you go to citr.ca slash donate, or uh, you can call in at 604-822-8648. If you call now and you say you're donating to the News Collective or to Seeking Office, you get the horoscope, so you should do it. Um, so now, uh, before we talk about Fun Drive a little more, we're going to actually go to some local news because this is a news show. And first on today's show, we will be discussing um, the community 
where we'll be discussing some community pushback on the Broadway corridor subway extension. Um, we're then going to turn to the voices of those living in Oppenheimer Park and find out why these folks choose to live in the tent city rather than in a city shelter. Um, so first, let's go to the Broadway subway corridor extension. Um, this isn't new. Uh, as you know, the extension of the Broadway corridor subway, a subway line that's set to go along Broadway, um, was voted on in council on January 30th that it be extended all the way to UBC. Okay, so we all know that's the case. So since that's happened, the city is entering into a stage where they're starting to plan. Um, they're starting to plan how this subway is going to affect communities and what they're going to do to sort of um, control uh, the effects of the subway line. So um, the effect it will have on the communities, the communities along the corridor and the neighborhoods that extend from that. So... Um, uh, the Kitts Residents Association um, actually had some posters they put up around Kitts, and uh, they basically organized a town hall this past, was it Wednesday? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, no, it was actually Tuesday night. Sorry, this past Tuesday hall. night. So the yeah. Kitts Residents Association organized a town hall to talk about the implications of this corridor um, and the impacts it might have on their neighborhood. It was a space for people to voice questions and concerns, essentially. So reporter Samuel Jones, who I have in studio with me now, attended this town hall, um, as well as a press briefing held by the city the following day. Um, so Sam, can you start out by telling me how you found out about this town hall? Well, Alex, I saw posters sort of walking around my um, adopted uh, neighborhood, I guess, of Kits, and uh, it starts off saying, SkyTrain to UBC, what's next? Will Kitsilano Ooh. and Point Grey become another Camby Corridor, another Metro Town or Brentwood? And I saw that and I was immediately like, okay, yeah, this is interesting because if you remember, yeah. the Canada line on Camby yeah. caused all kinds of just really serious disruption. In fact, um, the uh, BC Supreme Court even like sort of decided that uh, TransLink Canada would have to pay certain businesses losses um, right. for rental increases. And, and just the poor development planning that went into that really got a lot of people in the Camby Corridor very angry. Yeah. And it has changed the street. Some would say uh, for the worst in the short term, for the best in the long term. There's a lot of different opinions on that. But yeah. that gave some interesting context because it can it really shows you like why people would see that example and be like, oh, a subway down Broadway. You know, like, oh, my God. Like, so, you know, they had a few like listing off some some questions there. Like, okay. what will this mean for our neighborhood? Are there better options? Who's going to pay? Um, does this mean ras massive redevelopment? And so they were they were all really just you know, just trying to sort of get together, piece together what was going on with it, it would seem to me. Right. OK, so it seems like this poster, in addition to trying to piece things together, is expressing um, concern over the sort of perceived demise of the uh, West Vancouver neighborhood um, or na neighborhoods. So um, when you actually arrived at the West Kitts Residents Association Town Hall on Tuesday, um did you find that people had very extreme kind of like NIMBY views as the poster had suggested? Well, no, my personal experience, I didn't. Uh, I spoke with uh, Larry Binge, uh, co-chair of the West uh, Kitts Residents Association, and, and this is what he had to say. So if you wouldn't mind just starting off with your name and uh, a little bit about yourself and why you're here today. Uh, my name is Larry Binge. I am the co-chair of both the Coalition of Vancouver Neighborhoods, which covers the entire city, and West Kitts Residents Association, which is sponsoring this uh, get-together today. I am trained, have a degree in architecture. I'm an affiliate with a Master's of Urban Design program out at UBC and been involved in community work for I don't know how long. Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, what, what brings you here tonight? What are, we all, uh, what are we here to talk about at this uh, meeting today? We're here to talk about uh, a little bit of background and history and current standings of the uh, subway issue down uh, West Broadway. We're also going to talk about uh, development along West, along West Broadway and hopefully get into a little bit about the future of what may happen and what we can do to uh, perhaps help it happen. 
All right, interesting. So I see uh, you've passed out a sheet to people with uh, a list of options, uh, and one of the first ones is uh, which transit option would you prefer for the RBD to UBC transit improvement? So it looks like you're trying to really create a dialogue here. Yeah. And I found that interesting uh, due to the fact that your uh, poster was very um, it was very uh, much in a, an assertive uh, sort of message, wasn't it? Uh, this uh, kind it was, of it was yeah. a little bit yeah it was a little bit assertive, but. Uh, uh, partially that's to get people's attention and to be, get people out because uh, I think uh, talking with people around the neighborhood there's a lot of confusion about about this whole issue so uh, really one of the big things about tonight's event is to hopefully educate some people so that they have a little bit clearer notion of what's going on. All right so as far as yourself uh, do you sort of align with the position of the poster or are you kind of um kind of s sort of uh, taking you at face value back there about what, what you're saying there and wondering if that's kind of all it is at this point. Well, I have my own opinion about things, but uh, as representative of the coalition and of West Kitts Residents Association, I tend to take more of a middle ground to uh, try to get the facts, assess the facts, and draw conclusions from that, and also share it with the rest of the membership, and uh, we try to reach consensus whenever we're moving on some things. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I might have some questions after the show. All right. Um, okay. So that was uh, Larry Binge. Um, and uh, he is, could you remind me what his role is? Uh, Larry Binge is a co-chair of the West Kitts uh, Residents Association. Okay. So he helped organize this um, town hall. Mm -hmm. And so he, he admits in that clip that he, he and others made the poster a bit more provocative than most folks than the opinions held by most folks actually living in, in West Van. Um, so I'm just curious, like on this paper he was handing out, um, there are options that he's uh, putting forward for the the subway corridor. Um, what are what were some of those options? What were people talking about? Well, they were just essentially talking about the sort of like development strategy that they'd like to see the city take. Um, and what is that development strategy they'd like uh, to see the city take? Well, I'm not really sure because there were sort of multiple options. Mm -hmm. uh, to be okay. honest with you, it's hard to recall all of the options or yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But what I what I'll what I will say is that there was sort of an open dialogue with a lot of um, different sort of opinions on their sort of sheet that they were uh, talking about. And you, and, and you you know, you heard him say he's interested in getting a consensus amongst mm -hmm. members of the West Kitts Residents Association. So they want to essentially, they also want a petition. So um, okay. what it really looks like is that they want to essentially get together like, okay, here's what we in the neighborhood want. Mm -hmm. And then they want to bring that to the city and say, you know, like, here, here's what's up, essentially, is 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 what I gathered that makes sense. Uh, from being there. Yeah. So, um can you tell me a bit about the demographic that was attending this town hall? Yeah, absolutely. So it was really um, primarily elderly people. Okay. Um, the younger people um, were mostly um, young women, uh, mm -hmm. and some of them were accompanied by children. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think it mostly like mothers mm -hmm. and uh, older senior citizens were attending this one. Uh, that's certainly true about the makeup that I at least saw of the West Kitts uh, Residents Association Um um, itself, um, a lot of the people who were setting up chairs, taking signatures, um, getting people to sign in. Uh, they wanted right. everyone signing in. By the way, they wanted a, a very clear record of everybody who was there. Okay. Um, yeah, they um, seemed to be older folks that were mostly interested. So I'm just wondering, like, we don't know exactly what conclusion they arrived at, or they probably didn't arrive at any. It was, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a pulse taking. Definitely. Um, gathering and a place to ask questions but what is the general sentiment like what did did most people want a certain thing like um for the city to do to ensure their neighborhoods remain uh maintain the the character for lack of better term yeah. that they currently have like was there any sort of um, overarching themes that you took away? Well, you know, I definitely didn't um, hear anyone sort of like any uh, number of people say, okay, this is <laughs> the solution that we think will work. Um, I think mostly the sentiment is, um, you know, change is something that, you know, they feel they need to be consulted on. I think what it comes down okay. to is the main sentiment that was walked away with is they need to talk to us about this is, is sort of what I gathered. Um, I think because of the way the poster was formatted and because of its sort of like very... 
um, sort of slanted uh, perspective that the poster offers. I think they definitely attracted a crowd of people that are less open to the change that the UBC Broadway subway. Right, more of a NIMBY crowd. More of a NIMBY crowd, absolutely. I mean, um, although it it wasn't anything like a NIMBY rally, right? Yeah. Like like it was definitely, like you said earlier, a pulse taking. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so after attending this West Van Town Hall on Tuesday night, you went the next morning to a city briefing on the overview of the Broadway plan that mm-hmm. the city is working on. So this plan um, is uh, how the city will develop the Broadway subway route. Um, the briefing was meant to highlight the goals and priorities of the plan um, and to outline opportunities for public involvement, uh, including consultation events, which mm-hmm. actually start today. Um, so the city will be going to different communities and consulting with them. Communities obviously affected by this uh, subway extension. So can you just tell me the main highlights of this briefing or what you learned? Well, what I learned at this yeah. briefing is that they have a uh, vested interest in essentially uh, talking to or so they claim talking to uh, community members, um, you know, uh, the uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Kelly made no uh, Gil Kelly, the Gil Kelly, yeah, planner. he made no um, sort of like he didn't dance around it, like he does not want a repeat of the Canada Line debacle, um, and sort of like used that as sort of like a sort of like yeah, no, we learned from that, and uh, we're what gonna, is the Canada Line debacle? Oh uh, well, the uh, Camby uh, corridor. And everything that went wrong with that, with the sort of ways they were tunneling uh, down Canby, uh, okay. the construction, the uh, rezoning happening previous to construction, as opposed to during construction, okay. a lack of consultation with communities. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, that sort of thing um, got people very um, upset in that area and um, was kind of a, a bit of a, uh, a black mark on the Canada line. I mean, the contractor... Um, SNC Lavalin was sued, um, you know, like, um, uh, and and as I, I think I mentioned just earlier in the show, TransLink uh, had to pay out um, money to uh, certain businesses. So, yeah. yeah, they don't want a repeat of that. And they were right. very honest about that. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, so far looking like a very, like, transparent um, procedure, I would say. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, and you actually had a chance to ask Gil Kelly a question. Um, I did. Can you tell listeners what that question was? Yeah, well, I basically asked him to what extent the city would be implementing the feedback they received through their community consultations. I'm a bit cynical. Uh, let's take a look at yeah. what he said. All right, here we go. Oh, sorry, we just have the wrong clip though, there, so I'm just going to grab a new one. But um, while I just grabbed that, uh, Sam, do you mind telling me, um, uh, like, where was this briefing held? And sort of who, it was it just for the press or was it also for the public? Oh, this briefing was, um, I think, like, open. Like, I think anyone could have gone in, but it was definitely a press briefing. Like, because I'm, I'm pretty sure it was released um, through a, a media uh call out um, yeah. but uh yeah no i i'm sure any anyone could have just walked in there i mean there was no security at all um but uh yeah it was at city lab and city lab is uh right on canby very close to city hall uh right off of canby i should say um very close to city hall and um sort of the point of city lab is for exactly what we were doing there uh as well as um, sort of having the public in to sort of talk about things and talk about like planning with the city. And that, that's kind of like the city lab initiative, essentially. OK. Yeah, I see. Um, It looks like we don't actually have the clip here, but um, that's OK, because it was a bit hard to hear anyway, because you're mm-hmm. in like a large room. Right. But can you just basically tell me what Gil Kelly said in response to you asking sort of to what extent they would be actually implementing the feedback they received through community consultation? Yeah, I'll put the question in sort of the more exact words I used. Um, okay. I sort of said, like, you know, um, will um you be simply taking their advice or acting on their advice like um what is the power of the citizens to affect change um it it is a hard question to answer obviously like that's a that's a pretty like in your face question i will admit and so um he sort of came back um with what i would judge to be a very like sort of um straightforward kind of answer which was along the lines of well you know like we really do want to talk to people about this um uh the point of the public consultation process is to ensure that this goes smoothly and that people are happy and people are um, able to voice their concerns and opinions about uh the the broadway subway extension uh you know so that this is uh you know he, he definitely um understood like the sent the sentiment that i expressed in that question yeah 
Yeah, and it's definitely the goal, uh, or so they say, but, you know, there's no reason not to believe it's the goal of the city to actually take into account what people want. So, like you said before, we don't have another Canby corridor kind of issue where we have a bunch of unhappy businesses and residents in a neighborhood who were disrupted by um, poorly planned, poorly zoned uh, construction of rapid transit. Yeah, and so. I can I can say talking mm-hmm. to people in um, Kitsilano because I live there, mm-hmm. people are incredibly concerned about rising rents. Like there there are people who are yeah. sort of talking as if they're going to be out of their apartments in a few years. So yeah, like yeah, people definitely. are definitely worried and concerned. And so I feel like that public consultation process, if it goes to plan and if people are really uh, you know accounted for and listened to, it'll it'll be it'll be good. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to take a really uh, quick break now, um, and then we're going to come back with some more news and some more talk of FunDrive. As a reminder, it is still FunDrive here at CITR. Uh, We um, are fundraising for our $40,000 goal. We're almost halfway there. Today is technically the last day, although we still have our finale show tomorrow at Redgate. It's going to be really awesome. We have some great local bands. We have um milk one of my favorite bands playing um we're gonna have a silent auction uh redgate is located at main and second if you're interested as well um and it's just gonna be uh it's gonna be really sweet um and it's a great way to show your support um especially because you get to go to a fun show and hang out with your friends and uh I don't know. It's all good. Um, so we're going to we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more news on Democracy Watch, um, CHR's local news program. Here we go. plays every hour on the hour as part of our flagship station ID. If you do recognize this song, chances are less than 1 in 12 that you have donated to CITR. That means 11 out of 12 of our regular listeners are getting our content for free. So naturally, we called local businesses to see if we could get that kind of a deal. Here's how things went when we called Duffin's Donuts. Hello, Duffin's Donuts. Hi, um, I was wondering if I can get 12 pupusas, but just pay for one of them. Like, do we, do if, we owe you? Oh, you cinnamon roll? N- no, you, you don't owe me. Just, I was just seeing if, like, that was a deal I could make. Really? Yes. Okay. Maybe in 20 years? In 20 years? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I was hoping for it now, years? though. But no, 20 years later. 20 I, years. I think, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll try in 20 years. You can show your support right now on your mobile device or computer by heading to citr.ca slash donate or in person and over the phone during our annual fundraising week, February 28th to March 7th. Donate to keep CITR weird. The Vancouver International Women in Film Festival is back for its 14th celebration of cinema created by women from around the world. Running from March 5th to 10th at Viv Van City Theatres, the festival offers a variety of programming for filmmakers and the community alike. Go for the film screenings and stay for the parties, panels, discussions, workshops, artist talks, and more. Tickets are on sale now. Visit womeninfilm.ca for full details. Do you recognize the song playing in the background? It plays every hour on the hour as part of our flagship station ID. If you do recognize this song, chances are less than 1 in 12 that you have donated to CITR. That means 11 out of 12 of our regular listeners are getting our content for free. So naturally, we call... All right. Uh, I hope you enjoyed... That ad again, um, since you had already heard it, we faded it out. And the message is, please donate to CATR's Fun Drive. My name is Alex DeBoer, and you're listening to Democracy Watch on CATR 101.9 FM. Um, so it's Fun Drive. Uh, you've heard all our ads a million times. Uh, you've heard us talking on our shows. 
and begging you to donate. And that is what I'm doing again now. Um, Basically, our goal, as I mentioned, is to raise $40,000, which will go towards our operating budget and will allow us to keep making cool, weird content um, and to keep producing local news coverage like we do on this radio show every week. Yeah, and a bit of background on CITR. The station has been around since 1937 Whoa. when it began as a student club. Uh, today, CITR is Vancouver's oldest independent media outlet. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, um, it is amazing, and it's especially sweet because CITR provides space for diverse community to come together and hang out and make media. And so we have tons of spoken word radio programming, like our Indigenous Collective, um, our sports collective, our arts co- collective, just like we have a ton of different opportunities for people with different interests to make talk radio. Uh, yeah. Um, and we also have a uh, gender empowerment collective, accessibility collective, uh, yeah, which you work with. A I lot, work Alex. with a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, this collective centers the voices of those with uh, diverse abilities to explore topics like fashion and disability, disability justice, disability in the arts. Yeah, totally. Um, they do some really awesome stuff. It's, I'm always like so enamored with their subject matter. It's really interesting and so rarely talked about in mainstream media. Um, so, and of course, CHR has the most amazing collective, which you're listening to now, the News Collective. Um, and we try really hard to uh, cover overlooked stories, um, stories about marginalized people. We try to look at stories with a different lens, maybe a feminist lens, an indigenous lens. Um, we try to uh, we try to dig into things as well and explain to people a bit about how the city works. Uh, I'm really interested in kind of pulling the veil back and letting people know, like, this is how uh, bylaws are passed in, in City Hall. This is what it's like to, um, you know, go down to City Hall and talk to a counselor. Uh, I don't know, just like really give people a sense of how their local democracy is working and hopefully empower them to get more involved. Yeah, and so if you want to keep us going and keep allowing us to do that amazing work, and, you know, if you love our, our free podcast, Seeking Office, Seeking Office, please call 604-822-8648 to donate to the News Collective. Uh, that's 604 822 Eight six four eight. You can also donate online at citr.ca slash donate. Yeah, it's honestly really easy. There's like um, a page that'll come up. You can input your information. You can win our amazing prizes. Again, we have like a tote. We have a patch, uh, a special edition CITR fun drive patch that you can put on your jean jacket or whatever. Um, we also have um, these really cool socks that are black and have a ruby on them uh because it is our ruby jubilee we've been around for more than 80 years um and if you want to add to that and uh keep us going for another 80 years please donate um in addition once again the news collective has a special show prize which is a vancouver city hall horoscope so um that's pretty awesome uh you might be wondering which city councillor am I most like, according to the stars? As people so commonly ask themselves. I ask myself that oh, question every day. Every day. So we're like, well, let's figure it out for people so they can just check it out on a chart and know. So I know which city councillor I'm most like. And I was a bit surprised. And I can't tell you on air because then it will give away which councillor or mayor or we also have the mayor and we also have the city manager on there because we needed 12 um but i can't tell you who i am but you're gonna want to know who you are uh and you can do so for just 20 dollars, and then i will mail you a special horoscope so that's pretty awesome yeah and plus the station itself citr has a bunch of other awesome prizes yeah which i just talked about so it's like it's like you win 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 yeah um So now we're going to turn to some local news. Um, We have with us in studio uh, Chinar Kiper. Damn, damn. Uh, Kipper, darn. Uh, My apologies, Chinar. Um, So Chinar and fellow reporter and UBC journalism student uh, Ben Mosset 
um, went down to Oppenheimer Park yesterday to talk with folks who are living in its tent city, which, uh, you know, we've reported on before at Democracy Watch. Um, and so just to give you a bit of background before we jump into the story, um, last week, uh, City Councilor Gene Swanson put forward a motion, Motion B4, which was a bid to improve living conditions in Oppenheimer Park. In Motion B4, the solution proposed to improve conditions for those living in Oppenheimer Park, uh, people who are at the mercy of Vancouver's unpredictable weather, is the construction of an emergency shelter which would be erected in the park. However, because the motion Councillor Swanson put forward was basically the same as the one put forward by Parks Board Commissioners, because of the, sim- the similarity of these motions, Swanson's motion was deferred. Instead, the Parks Board will vote on the creation of an emergency shelter this Monday, March 11th. Right. So that's coming up. And in the meantime, the province actually had some uh, a big announcement this week. Um, they promised the city of Vancouver one point three million dollars to uh, keep three point one. I'm sorry. I'm so dyslexic. Don't worry. I about truly it. am. Three point one million dollars to keep eight Vancouver shelters open beyond their uh, their set closing date, which was March 30th. So with this added funding, these eight shelters in Vancouver um, with a total of 240 beds, will be operating until March 31st, 2020. And while shelters can be life-saving for folks who are experiencing homelessness, Councillor Gene Swanson has been critical of them, saying the money being spent to operate them could be better spent building actual homes for people, uh, such as temporary modular housing units. Right, and, and not only that, a lot of people uh, say that for them, Shelters aren't actually better than living on the street or in a tent, um, which might seem surprising to some listeners. So um, before we hear what some folks who are actually living in Oppenheimer Park have to say um, from their lived experience about shelters, uh, Chinar, can you set the scene for us? What exactly is going on in Oppenheimer Park? Well, when we arrived there, uh, it was actually everybody was a little rattled because earlier in the morning there had been a bit of a little raid, uh, not really a raid, sorry, let me take that back. It was more of a action to see if there was any um, uh, substance that could uh, cause any trouble, flammable uh, materials, mm-hmm. candles and everything, and remove them. But, of course, this disrupts an already very fragile system mm-hmm. right now. I mean, everybody's already, it's a difficult condition. It's cold outside. They are uh, they're having a hard time, in the uh, even without authorities coming in, stepping in. So... Everybody was a little rattled. When we arrived at the park, all the tents were lined up around the periphery. Uh, It was actually my first time there. I'm a Mm -hmm. newcomer to the city, but I'm told that they're normally around the center, uh, and they were around the periphery because of the police uh, police inspection. And, uh, yeah, some of them had been apparently thrown in the back of a dumpster. The owner wasn't around. Some of the owners had been out working. So, yeah, everybody was a little upset, and uh, we talked to several people. Right. And, uh, and so well, the so the first, um, at first you and Ben spoke with um, a married couple um, who had a dog who were living in the park. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about them? We're going to uh, play your interview with them. Yeah, uh, yeah they have a pretty sad story. Uh, they moved uh, here from Ontario, having... Promised, having been promised jobs and then found out they had been scammed. You can hear what they have to say for themselves. Yeah, uh, let's go to that. Um, I've been here for, give or take, three plus weeks. Three plus weeks? Mm. Okay. Um, and the city came by, some city staff, park rangers, and police came by this morning. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about that? Um, they came to clean up a little bit. I mean, I, I guess there was a, a few incidents that we had here. Some people's tents were thrown out. Um, they were not there. I mean, they were warned to be there. Um, if you're not there, your stuff's going to be tossed out because we're going to assume that you vacated. Considering the situation in, in Oppenheimer, that, that's understandable. If you, if you want to remain, you, you know, stay by your tent. So some people didn't do that and tents were uh, thrown away. But other than that, um, the police were were pretty fair and fine um, on with what they were doing. Um, fire marshals <laughs> on hand were very, you know, respectful to our, you know, uh, to us. I mean, for me, it's been one difficult task being here. But. Oh, yeah. Do you want to just talk about that briefly, your three weeks? Oh, huh, well, weeks you know, it's just, uh, yeah, during the day it's nice. I mean, you, it's a beautiful park. You see that, eh? You know, at, at night it, it has its... Uh, 
it has its, its turns and its moments, you know what I mean? So those that know the east side know what I'm talking about. Um, so, but I mean, as far as that, it's, the people are good here. We have a pretty good squad over there on the other side. Um, they, they, they help, you know, with harm reduction and all that, you know. We do get some overdoses here, and I think that's the hardest thing that I have to witness is that. What's your name? Felicia. Felicia, are you okay being recorded? Oh, no, that's fine. That's okay. okay. Um, you... This is my husband. Your husband, okay. Yes. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> um, is your name, how do you spell it? Would you like to spell that out? F-E-L-I-S-S-Y-A. Okay. Um, and how has your experience been? How long have you been at the camp? Uh, yeah, we came up here together on train okay. with our whole entire family, actually. And it's been one thing after the next. Honestly, Vancouver is very beautiful. And so this is the first time I've been here. Not so much for him, but for me, this is the very first time I've been here. And he's always wanted to take me here. And uh, Windsor, Ontario. And we just, you know, we came up for a job and it turned out to be completely fraudulent. And the guy scammed us completely. You know, we thought we both had positionings and everything. And, you know, we come up here, we try calling the numbers to raise the internet, it, with the website that had, he had was gone. Um, the address given was a false, it's a closed building, it wasn't even real, you know. And there's not much police can do when you don't have much to give them or a human to, you know, to give up to them. So we just had to stick it out and with no funds, that's not easy, especially when Vancouver is so expensive. Oh, yes. Compared to anywhere else living in Canada, so Ain't that the truth? high and dry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the high and dry. And is. trying to get shelter here is really it's been hard difficult. With an That's animal. been the most difficult thing because we have an animal and me and her. We don't want to be and separated neither. We don't want to be separated and so trying to find. Can't go to the oh. shelters. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's yeah, it's very difficult. There is some that do, but then those that do are just not a place you, you would want to bring your animal or, or, or you know. Some shelters that do accept pets. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, you just, you don't feel like, you just don't feel At least feel we don't feel so. I'm saying I don't feel the yeah, comfortability that's our of being there <laughs> with my dog that will, that will probably defend me if anybody tries to steal my shoes, get it? So, and that's the biggest, you know, I guess, worry there. You know, you have to worry about getting your stuff stolen while you're sleeping. And that's, you know, it's a pretty scary thing when you know you got somebody hovering over you while, while you're trying to rest. So yeah, it's been very uh, humbling for me coming down here. I mean, I've never had to ever live like this ever mm -mm. in my life. Ever. I'm 42 been in a years old, and yeah. I've never ever had to experience this. Never. And to experience this now has really made me uh, evaluate my life very much and, uh, and appreciate the things that I took for granted so long ago. So you're recently homeless. Yes. Yeah. At this present time, yeah. I mean, we were, we're we were actually recently blessed from uh, one of the workers at Connections. With regarding this tent here, um, because we used to sleep with the tarp on top of yeah. us and yeah, under us with, the tarp, with a whole yeah. bunch of blankets yeah. um, in front of the dugout, and then we got plus with a, a small tent in the beginning. That started to uh, create there was holes and mm -hmm. breakdown. So Justin from Connections, one of the workers there, he had given us this tent with mattress and sleeping bags and whatnot to yeah. add to our blankets. And uh, since like a couple of weeks ago, since we've last um, talked to somebody uh, on the paper. Um, they ha people came 24 hours later to give us some more plush blankets, yeah. which have really we felt really blessed for that as here. well. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> the community support is phenomenal, and we do have people that come up out of their way. The volunteers are coming, give sandwiches and that. So, you know, I'd just like to say thank you to all of them, yeah. you know, because they help make us feel, I mean, safe here. You know, and, and scenery when sometimes you may not have that that sense of uh, safeness. You know, what's your plan? Oh, definitely. Well, I, I, you know, at ASAP, we're just trying to look for some housing right now. Anyone that will just even take us. I know I got my dad out here, and I'm trying to get him off. My dad's 65 years old, so it's difficult to have him. He has the one side of the tent with the cot and all that. Yeah. But come on now, man. That's my dad. I feel so in, you know, embarrassed to even have that, him. let alone my wife out here, okay? Let alone being on camera to see, you know, who I am. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it, it humbled me so much to, you know, appreciate what I did have. Yeah, and honestly, um, just, what, three days ago, hon, it was, or four days now, yeah. we went to uh, almost 20 different uh, of yeah. those, uh, you know, those places. All those rooming Those hotels. rooms? The room hotels? SROs. Yes. SROs. Yeah. With yes. no luck. No. We had the money for shelter, but no place to rent. 
there was no vacant places anywhere. They kept telling us to go to Carnegie and that possibly there'll be something then, um, but there's no promise to anything. And we were on foot for all of them. We went everywhere possible. We took the whole list and went to each place down the list and not one place was available. And so we're still stuck here. And you know, the getaway's open on those cold nights, but that's not an easy place to, you know, be at all times yeah. because there's different varieties of people and you know yeah situations arise and handling you know it is, is yeah it's, it's maybe difficult but it's but we definitely maintain it you know we have our faith and you know that's pretty uh, what, what keeps us bonded together and happy especially yeah. in this time so we try to we sweep everywhere and Try and to keep everything fit. clean like our home. Like, come on, this is, this is crazy. i never seen so many crazy days. I was here in 2001, and it was a lot different. I mean, I guess it was still the same. But, yeah. And now to be here again, so many years later, in Oppenheimer. Thank you. So that couple outlines some really clear reasons why shelters simply aren't an option for them. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's really a hard hearing their story. hard hearing the story, and I wish them well. Uh, however, Ben and I also spoke to a single man living in the park, and despite not being in a couple and not having any pets to worry about, this fellow Scotty's his name said he would still rather live in Oppenheimer Park than go to a shelter. Let's hear what he has to say. Yeah, and just to add that to that, like uh, we're hearing, it seems like from a lot of people that shelters, like people of different. Uh, demographics and backgrounds at shelters are simply not an option. So, yeah, the, uh, for l- them, everybody we talked to was very pessimistic about both their chances of getting in and also uh, what it's like living there. I mean, they were not; they described you know a lot of hardships, even if you managed to get in. But yeah. it's also it was just hard even getting in. So yeah, and so the, at first we have this couple who um, are married and they have a dog. So if you go to a shelter, you can't stay together. I assume they have shelters split up by gender or they uh, regardless they don't let people sleep together so if you're a couple um that doesn't work and then you can't bring your pet so that doesn't work so that's a major problem Uh, everybody's items that's another one everybody complained about you know my stuff gets stolen if i is so yeah totally but then we also have as you just introduced this fellow scotty who is a single man living in the park and he also doesn't want to go to a shelter so Yeah. yeah let's hear what he has to say about why shelters um simply aren't an option for him. What's your name? My name is Scotty. Scotty? Yeah. Okay. Um, how long have you been camping at Oppenheimer? Uh, probably about four months now, I'd say, give or take. Four yeah. months? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's your experience been? Um, it's, it's, it's been a little bit rough, you know, um, with the city on our backs more often than not. You would think that they would want to help us and get us out of here into housing of some sort, But it almost seems like they're more along the lines of picking on us. You know, every morning they they show up, we have to collapse our tent. And if we don't, they'll take everything and throw it in the back of the dump truck no matter what. For instance, today they had what they call a big cleanup. Where they expect everybody to take everything down, move everything out until they're done cleaning up. And then we're allowed back in. But look, I mean, really, look how clean it really is. You know, it doesn't really look like they did much of a good job. To be honest with you, it's dirtier than when they left. Um, my buddy here, who was, had a tent right there, I don't know where he went, but he wasn't here this morning, so they took everything and threw it in the back of the dump truck. Everything he owned was in the back in that tent, and they just got rid of it. You know, I even offered to take it down for them, but he said, nope, if they're not here, it's not your responsibility, and they threw it out. Yeah, and... Uh, it's just, I don't know. It's 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 hard out here. They won't they they won't let us have propane to keep ourselves warm. They won't let us have candles because they're afraid of fires. But it's freezing out here. You know what are we supposed to do? Like, am I supposed to go? Would you rather me sleep on the sidewalk than in a tent at the park, or or what? Like I I don't know what to do. It's it's kind of a pain. But um, I was wondering if you have you tried to go to a shelter and if if you have or if you choose not to why why do you well if if you end up in a shelter you know not only do you have to stand in lines for who knows how many hours and you might not even get in but then you have to worry about bugs people stealing your stuff 
you know, all kinds of things. It's just, it's more um, convenient for me to have a tent out here where I can keep an eye on my stuff. I, I, you know, I know I'm going to have somewhere to stay tonight, you know, instead of like maybe standing in a lineup all night just to be at the end of the line and find out, oh, there's no more room, sorry. You just stood here for two hours and you don't even get a bed, right? Has something like that happened to you? Yeah, that's happened to me before, yeah. yeah. And, and I just I just give up on it, right? If it wasn't that, it was somebody stealing my bag, you know, or it's, it's something. It's always something, right? Yeah. And then there's just not enough. There's not enough shelters for everybody, right? It, it, they always fill up. They fill up quick, you know. If you drive by a shelter before they open, you'll see. There'll be a lineup, you know, almost as long as the block. And, uh... Yeah. Um, what do you hope the city does? Well, you in know, response to the tent city here. Um, I'm not saying they have to let us live here forever, but you know, give us a hand, right? If they could do something other than like, they come here every day, and they break our backs about collapsing the tent in the morning, but there's never really been any sort of uh, uh, movement towards like getting us out of here. There's never been any support like that or it's just it, it doesn't make sense to me they want us to get out of here but they don't want to do anything to help us at the same time right it's just whatever is easier and cheaper for them it seems is their solution every time you know what's your uh, what's your plan going forward are you going to try and stay well, here as long as you can well i mean i would rather not stay here as long as i can you know i'm i would like to get housing but even if I was to go to Carnegie Outreach and get, you know, on a waiting list, you know, that could be anywhere from a couple of months to half a year before I even see housing. And then what do I do till then? You know, everybody looks at me like I'm a, a nuisance on society because I'm out here sleeping in a tent. But where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? You know, it's, it's not exactly easy for me to be out here. You know, I don't want to be here, but this is... Uh, where uh, I ended up, I guess. Yeah, that's um, that's a really touching interview, and um, honestly, yeah, a lot of you know, any of us could have ended up there, and I think that that's sort of the universality of um, you know, people having bad luck really comes across in that interview. So thanks for uh, capturing that, Chinar. Um, so I mean, one of the things that. Uh, this individual Scotty is talking about as well in that interview is uh, the fact that people living in the tent city in Oppenheimer Park aren't allowed to have sort of anything flammable, candles, propane, so they can't really stay warm. Um, so there's this kind of battle of like bureaucracy happening there, right, where we have, you know, legitimate safety issues. We don't, it, it makes sense that the city doesn't want a fire to happen, but at the same time people are freezing. And then they say, okay, well, we have all these shelters you can go to or warming centers. And then people say, you know, what Scotty was saying, right? Can't get in. Now, in Oppenheimer Park, there is a building in the center mm -hmm. that has uh, some minimal facilities, you know, actually a karaoke. People are actually having some entertainment facilities. Oh, as really? Well. In yes, that? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah no, mm. it's, uh, they set up karaoke there. There's some basic, like, you know, uh, coffee and everything. So, and that is warm, a uh, warm building. So, uh, yes, people can go inside for a little warmth, but I don't know how long that stays up. Well, we went there in the afternoon, it was open. I'm not sure if it's 24 hours or anything, but it is a small building, about like as big as the room we're in right now. Which is how big? <laughs> Which is... Uh, I don't know, the size <laughs> of rooms. Not a big room. Exactly. Smaller than most living rooms, for sure. There we yeah. go, some, <laughs> some yeah, perspective exactly. from Nothing. Sam. Yeah. Because I'm just going to make up some numbers. I'm so yeah, bad I'm like dimensions. really bad with them. So it's either 20,000 square feet or like three square feet, something in between. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah, so there is an option to stay warm. But um, at the end of the day, people would rather, again, not be separated from their partners, their pets, and not um, have their stuff stolen. And some safety issues have come up, too, in these both of these interviews, right? It's exactly, like, exactly. You and don't you know the people others. you're around. Like, you, ha I don't know, you're, like, sleeping in a room with them. It's uh, kind of scary. That's exactly. That's what some uh, – and we also talked to other people as well right now. We just uh, – you know, we played two of the interviews. Yeah. But uh, other people we talked to similarly mentioned you don't know who you're with. And yeah. uh, there seemed to be a little bit of 
almost fear, you know, and um, and obviously all the interviews repeatedly mentioned the having your items taken from you, which is a big anxiety. And from what I understand, the tents probably provide a degree of privacy and control over your own space and items, which matter when you have so little uh, control at that moment in yeah. your life. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, uh, and the, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Sam. Oh yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your reporting, uh, Chinar. And to note, uh, Ben, your reporting partner, sent an email uh, to the city asking what they're doing uh, to house folks living in Oppenheimer Park, and they essentially replied with just a list of everything they've been doing. Yeah. Um, which you know we've talked about on the show. I'm not going to rehash all of it, but just about the emergency shelters, about emergency weather response shelters, and all that, all that sort of thing. Um, none of it really addressing anything they brought up about the concerns about not being able to bring your pets in, not being able to be a couple in uh, the shelters. Uh, just nothing really that sort of addresses sort of the hardship that we've examined uh, right. today. Yeah. Which brings us to our sort of point of focus um, in this story, which is that while the city does have all these warming centers and shelters and the province just gave $3.1 million to extend uh, the amount of time the shelters in Vancouver will be open, that's all great. But if people won't go there, what's the point, right? Like, so we're, we're going to continue reporting on this. Um, we've been looking into the process by which applicants get placed in temporary modular housing. Um, the homelessness count that is done annually, I believe, starts on March 12th, which is this Tuesday. Um, so we're going to also see coming up soon how the, I think, about 600 units of temporary modular housing um, has impacted the number of homeless people in Vancouver and whether it has at all, right? So, you know, it's it's really interesting and, and so important to look at the efforts that are being taken by the city and the province um, to deal with homelessness and the housing crisis in Vancouver and whether those efforts are actually amounting to results, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can send out press releases, you can open buildings, but... If there's the same number of people living on the street, something's not working. Yeah. Well, yeah. Definitely. Um, so you're listening to CITR 11.9 FM. This is Democracy Watch. Um, we are going to take a very short break and then be back with a, uh, to talk about Fun Drive. So please stay tuned. Um, I'm just having some trouble playing this. Here we go. Uh Oh, it's not working. Um, well, we could just talk about Fun Drive since the PSAs aren't working because that's really better. And, dear listeners, you've probably heard all our PSAs a million times. So we just wanted to remind you that it is Fun Drive at the station. This is basically the last day you have to donate, although we have our finale party happening at Redgate tomorrow evening featuring BB and Milk. Uh, and we're going to have a silent auction, and it's going to be a great chance to uh, come out and hang out with your favorite programmers at CITR and have a beer or have a pop or whatever and just uh, don't laugh at that, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just, like, hang out and unwind because this has been a really intense week for us here at CITR. Uh, we've, been, we've, been, we've been fundraising like crazy. It's been really – it's been a lot. It's been great. Um, but we are ready to unwind and wrap up. So, yeah. Yeah, if you're a fan of our news collective and, you know, our wonderful podcast, Seeking Office, please donate so that we can keep making that awesome and really important content. Yeah. Um, so, again, if you want to donate to the news collective, you can get a sweet one-of-a-kind City Hall horoscope it's dope. You can find out which city councilor or the mayor or the city manager uh, you are most like according to the stars. Um, so all you have to do is donate $20. You can do so by going to citr.ca slash donate or calling 604-822-8648 um, and just select on the page uh, if you're doing it online that you're donating to the News Collective or Seeking Office and you will receive that horoscope if you donate $20. Um, Fundrive is really, really important to us. It basically is part of the money we raise is part of our operating, bu operating budget. So if you care about CHR existing, like if you care about the fact that there's a place where people, 
in the UBC community and the Vancouver community can come together and hang out and do something positive with their time and and write for Discorder magazine or create radio for any of a number of programs we have here at the station, then honestly, if you can spare a few bucks, please consider donating. Yeah, and I'll add, we try to make creative news. We try to push boundaries in terms of structure and style, and we want to engage our listeners. We believe news coverage needs to be innovative, innovative sorry, to retain and grow listenership. And so that's what we try to be. Yeah. Um, and like so much of our programming amplifies undercovered voices. Um, we have spoken word collectives, which are basically groups of volunteers who come together and, and make talk radio, um, like the Gender Empowerment Collective, the Accessibility Collective, the Indigenous Collective. Um, these are all really important spaces for people to to be able to go on the radio and have a voice and just hang out with one another and and be friends and uh, you know form community. Um, it's just something I believe in a lot personally, and uh, I think um, I don't know. It's just such a great cause. Um, and yeah, so again, please come out to our fun drive finale as well, which is at Redgate um, on this Friday evening. Uh, Redgate is at Main and Second. Some great local bands. There's an event on Facebook you can check out. Um, yeah, and I mean, just like you know, we hear in the news all the time. Media is suffering, journalism is suffering, uh, especially local journalism is suffering. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, and here you have a group of people who are volunteering their time to go out to City Hall, to go down to Oppenheimer Park, to, you know, hang out in Vancouver and actually talk to people, to put together creative um, and engaging news stories and give them to you in radio format and on a podcast seeking office. And honestly, I think that that's a really important cause to give back to. Absolutely. Like, I think most of our listeners will agree. Um, so show us your support and donate to Fun Drive. Once again, the phone number is 604-822-8648. Or you can go online and donate at citr.ca slash donate. And I think that is all we have for you today. Um Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back again next Thursday with more local news coverage. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, Seeking Office. And we will see you on Friday um, at Redgate for our finale show because that is the place to be, quite frankly. So uh, stay tuned for more great programming on CITR 101.9 FM. Uh, signing out.